Good morning, Jeremy here with the More Earnest Heed, and we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 23 today. Today is my first day of physical therapy. So I go in at three o'clock to the hospital, and I'm actually pretty excited about that. You say, why are you excited for physical therapy? Because that means I'm going to start moving, start getting this knee better. So I um, had a pretty painful uh, sleep last night because on top of what's going on with my knee, I had a bout flare up of plantar fasciitis. So if any of you have ever had that, you'll know that it's near impossible to walk on. It's so painful. And that happened in my bad foot. So just yesterday, I got the clear to put full weight on my bad foot. And then I had this flare up of plantar fasciitis, so I can't even put weight on it. But I have this jet stream, like ice, ice water infused compress, com, compass, compress. What do they call the thing? A compress, uh, ice pack that you, you put on. And I had that on my foot last night. Kristen, and I woke her up a couple times just to help me with it. And I tell you what, that is a miracle worker. So if you have plantar fasciitis, you'll want to get a jet stream. This is what it looks like. Let me just kind of show you. This thing here. So it hooks up here. And then basically I've got it on my foot over here. Just kind of wrap it around. And that makes it to where it constantly is putting uh, uh, kind of um, swelling the compress with ice water. So it's like having an ice pack on it. I mean, it feels like your feet are freezing, but I tell you, this takes the swelling right down and it feels good to have that kind of constriction and that constant um, opening and closing and that swelling of the pack. So that, I woke up this morning feeling a million times better. I was able to walk on it, had to go to, on to the job site and deal with the, talk to the foreman and the electricians about the new pizza restaurant. And um, I felt good. So I'm having it today. Hopefully this goes away. So if you have plantar fasciitis, I highly recommend getting one of those. Obviously its purpose was for my knee, but I don't really need it for my knee because the swelling went down. I need it for my foot. So let's pick up uh i feel like every day is a, is a health update little report on my life that you probably don't care about but that's what i'm going through so uh you came to me so we're going to talk about it <clears throat> genesis chapter 23 we're going to deal with an entire chapter chapter on the burial of sarah abraham's wife that that passes away and we'll see that right in the first verse in chapter 23 in verse 1 the bible reads and sarah was 107 and 20 years old so 127 these were the years of the life of sarah i'd say that's a nice ripe old age um, i don't want to live to 127 years but you remember just 27 years ago she was a fine looking lady because everybody wanted her and abraham had to lie about it but um just um, 127 years was her lifespan, and Sarah died in just Jara. The name was Hebron in the land of Canaan, and that's what it'll become to be known as uh, for the Hebrews is Hebron. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I might bury my dead out of my sight. Now, Abraham is in a strange land. This land that he is in, it belongs to the Hittites or the sons of Heth. That's what the Hittites are. Um, these guys were worshipers of the sun goddess, obviously polytheistic. They probably worshiped many gods. They would probably even have taken on the the god of abraham is just another god if if they wanted to uh because they were like god collectors now let me tell you something about someone who's polytheistic you say well if they take on jehovah god aren't they also you know taking on the true god and the answer is no because the bible says i am lord thy god and beside me there is none other you don't get to choose god or in our day jesus jesus christ we believe in jesus christ as the messiah you don't just take him on and Buddha and Hindu and the God of Islam, you know, Allah or whoever. It's him and no other. Um, the Bible says that he is a jealous God. 
Um, the Bible says in order to be saved that you have to have a repentance from idols, meaning you have to turn from all false gods to turn to the living and true God, okay, in order to be saved. So you don't get to say, I, I worship Buddha and I worship Jesus. It's like kind of like double dipping. Like, so I'm good in both areas, whether I'm a Buddhist and a Christian. That's not how that works. Those people that claim that are not saved according to the Bible. Just like the people who would claim their works and a free gift and try to do both for salvation. There's some people that, that say, well, I do believe in Jesus and I trust him for salvation, but I also think I need to be baptized as a baby. I also think I need to have good works. You cannot do both. You cannot have this kind of polytheistic uh, approach to thing where it's Jesus plus all the false gods, or it's the work of Jesus on the cross and my own works. It's one or the other. And in order to be saved, you need to repent of all other false gods and turn to the living and true God. Repent of all your works and turn to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Or if you're in unbelief, you're an atheist, you have to repent of your unbelief and turn and believe the gospel. That is the only way to be saved. And so these, um, these Hittites, these sons of Heth, were not a saved people. They were worshipers of many gods, mainly the sun goddesses. And this group that means Heth means enclosure. And kind of geographically, if you think where modern day Turkey is, that is the kind of the geographical location of uh, where these people built their empire. And it was called the Hattusa Empire. And in around 1600, 1600 uh, BC, 1600 BC is where they formed their big empire. Now we know that these are part of the people, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Amorites, all these guys dwelt in the land of Canaan. And it's who ultimately the Israelites would have to drive out before they can take that land. But Abraham was kind of going off the greater picture. Normally, he would go back uh, to bury his dead in the land of his ancestors where he came from. But notice he chooses to not bury Sarah where he came from, but where he was going to. And he was looking toward the promise of God and saying, one day we're going to possess this land. I'm going to go ahead and bury my wife in the land of promise. Now, Sarah died. She never got to see them take that land. Obviously, we know that not even Moses, who led the children of Israel later, later on down the road, was ever able to see that land. Uh, he, they, he had to stop and, and see it from a distance, but he was never able to be a part of taking that land of Canaan. And so he was going ahead and putting his marker in the ground, and he was looking, you're going to see in this chapter, to buy a foot of a piece of that land in the future promise of where God promised them. And guys, that's something that we should take note of as Christians. If God has promised us greater things in our life, and we know we're destined for a better place, we ought to be putting more things. The Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Um, and we should be putting, laying up our treasure in where we're going, not where we're coming from. I think sometimes we get so much of a anchor down here and we're burying our dead here, and we're putting so much stock here, and we're buying land here, and we're doing everything here in this world, but this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That's how the hymn goes, and we should be setting our treasures and our affections on what God has promised us, not what we're coming out of. So that's a good lesson to take from this. Let's keep reading. So Abraham says he's a stranger, he's a sojourner, he wants to bury his dead out of his sight. Verse 5, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulcher, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulcher, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Wow, what a cool thing. And notice there's no charge for it. Not only do the sons of Heth give Abraham free choice of any sepulcher. Now, guys, these are something that they're investing in to bury their own dead. If their sepulcher is there, they've already picked, they plot, they've already picked, uh, built a sepulcher uh, ready to bury their dead. And they are willing to give it up to a stranger, an admittingly sojourner in their land, because of the reputation that Abraham has. In fact, they called him a mighty prince among us. They have great respect. No doubt, 
this guy's fame has traveled even, even throughout the land of the Hittites. So what great respect. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Some of us would do well to take note of how Abraham protected that name and a good name meant much to him and a good name traveled very far. I know uh, my grandfather, he had a good name and he was known for having a good work ethic in Portugal and people would want to hire him to go and tend to the fields because they knew they can get full days uh, uh, value out of him for the wages that they would pay him. And he developed this reputation and this um, this rapport for having a good work ethic and being trustworthy. And I'm going to reference him again uh, when we come to the end of this chapter. But I tell you what, your credit, your social credit can go a long way. And, you know, that's what a credit score is, is basically how trustworthy are you that if someone loans you money that you can pay back this bill. And it looks like Abraham had great credit even among the Hittites, even among people who would later become his enemies, he had a great rapport. And I would challenge you, Christian, that you should have a good name, not just amongst other Christians, but also amongst the unsaved world, that even lost people or even people that would technically be considered your enemies still have a great respect for you. And that's how we ought to be known as Christians. Um, verse 7, And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. So obviously uh, um, uh, retaliating with that same respect, bowing himself to them and, 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 and taking on the respect that they were giving him. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me to Ephron, the son of Zoar, that he may give me the cave of Amechpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of the field. For as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of, of the burying place amongst you. So there's a specific field at the end of this field uh, from Ephron, he's the, he's the one that owns it, of Zoar. And, and this is a specific place that he wants. Um, and later on, obviously, that would eventually all be their land. But what Abraham is doing is he's not getting it as a gift from the strangers. He doesn't want that land just given to them like they were trying to give him the sepulcher. He wants to be able to purchase it so it is lay claim that it is rightfully his. He didn't take anything, he didn't steal it, and he didn't get it as a gift. He wants to pay for it, and he's willing to pay whatever he says it costs or whatever this man says it is. And here, in a second here, you're gonna see the first price gouging ever done in the Bible. Yes, believe it or not, Joe Biden wasn't the first person to price gouge. This has been happening for thousands of years. And um, look at e e Ephraim dwelt among the children of Heth, or Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went in the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me, the field give I thee. And the cave that is therein, I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it thee. Bury thy dead. Boy, that would have been nice to just kind of take it. He's saying, I'm just going to give it to you. Go ahead and bury your dead there. Um, and, and look what happened. And Abraham bowed himself before the people of the land. Now, when it says in the audience of the people, these are the witnesses. Okay, things were done before witnesses. And I'm going to look at that and give you an example in a minute. But um, this, this didn't want to be said if it was just two people communing between the two of them and trying to strike a deal. One can say they lied or they didn't say the right thing. But it was done in the audience of all the people. So there was other witnesses for verification of this transaction. And he spake unto Ephraim in the audience of the people, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me. I'll give thee money for the field. So I don't want just, I just don't want it for free. I want to buy this land. I'll give thee money for the field. Take it of me and I'll bury my dead there. Now watch how Ephraim changes his mind. He goes from giving it to, for free to look what he says. And Ephraim answered Abraham saying unto him, my Lord, hearken unto me. The land's worth 400 shekels of silver. Okay, now I don't, uh, I need to do a study to see what the comparison of 400 shekels was at around this 2000 BC. Uh, but I'm going to show you that it's a lot of money because in the future, people are able to buy land way, 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 way cheaper 
Now, remember, this is just a piece of land that's at the end of the field with a cave. But people are able to buy land way cheaper than 400 cycles of silver. This isn't now chump change. You know, uh, it, just in case you're thinking this guy went from free to, oh, just give me a little money. I mean, it went from, I'm going to give it to you for free to a lot of money. He said it's worth 400 shekels of sil silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephraim, and Abraham weighed to Ephraim the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. So what exactly he asked for, there was no negotiation. Abraham gave him exactly what he said, what Ephraim said the field is worth. Now I have my doubts that it was worth that. And I want to show it to you. Look at over at 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 24 through 25. 2 Samuel chapter 24. I kind of wanted to go and see, you know, what were people buying other things for? Let's run some comps, right? You know, if we want to see what real estate's worth at this time, what do you do to determine the worth of real estate? Well, you just kind of run comps at what other things are worth around it and what other things are sold for, right? That's how you determine its value. So look at uh, uh, 2 Samuel. I'm in 1 Samuel. Hang on one second. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And again, I, I always forget to put my bookmarkers in the places I'm going to. Uh, so sorry about the dead space here. Worst thing you can have on the radio is just dead air. 2 Samuel chapter 24, look at verse 24 through 25. And the king said unto Arnoa, um, Ar Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which thou doth cost me nothing. So I don't want to, David's buying this land here, the Onan's threshing floor. And he doesn't want to just have it as a gift, same as Abraham. He wants, when he goes to offer, he wants it to be something he's purchased, he's put labor in. And, you know, I tell you what, even for your kids, if they're not buying their own stuff, it's not worth near as much to them, is it? You know, when you give them stuff and you just constantly give them everything for free, notice how they treat those things. They throw it around. They don't care if it gets destroyed. There was no sacrifice made. It didn't cost them anything. But what happens when a child actually has to take their own money that they may be uh, cleaned up the yard or mowed lawns or had to do some sort of work to earn. Boy, that thing becomes way more valuable to them because they bought it. They earned it. They worked for it. They paid for it. And such is true in the case of David here. He wants to buy, he wants to buy this, um, this piece of land so that he may build an altar there and offer it to his God. And he wants it to be a value, something that he worked for or and paid for. So David bought the, uh, so David bought the, threshing floor and the oxen for look at this and this one comes with oxen the one the one in uh in abraham's case came with a cave it was just a piece of land in a cave that's all it was on this is the threshing floor and oxen for 50 shekels of silver okay so you have abraham buying his parcel for 400 shekels of silver david's buying this threshing floor and oxen and so he got some livestock with it for 50 shekels of silver. Let me run one more comp over here. Look at Jeremiah. Look at the book of Jeremiah. Isaiah Jeremiah 3219. 32:19. 32:19. The Bible reads, great, uh, in the right place, 32, 19, great in counsel and mighty in work for thine eyes. This can't be right. 19, 19. 33, write this down wrong. Man, I wish I had this right. Hang on a second. Let me let me pause for one second. Make sure I have this this reference. Hang on. Well, I don't want to change this. I think if I make this go away, it'll stop the whole video. But anyways, wherever I had, I think I wrote down 
the wrong reference because somewhere, I think in this chapter, someone buys a parcel of land for uh, 17 shekels of silver, 17 shekels of silver. And I wish I could find it so I can show you all what is included in this land. But it's obviously a, um, or this, this portion of land was more valuable. It was bigger. It was, I forgot what, what all was in it. I'll have to look it up later. Maybe even on the next video, I'll get the right reference and go back. But it was uh, of more value than what Abraham's parcel was. And it was 17 shekels of silver. So you have uh, that and you have David buying the threshing floor and oxen for 50 shekels of silver. But here Abraham does his deal and strikes up a deal with, with Ephraim. He doesn't care. He probably could have said 800 shekels of silver. Abraham had the money. He's a rich guy. He was a man of much substance, of great rapport and reputation. So he was going to pay whatever. It wasn't about the money, but I do believe just running the comps that this was price gouging uh, and maybe the first instance of price gouging in the Bible. So, um, Anyways, let's keep reading. Where did we leave off? So he says he's going to give him 400 shekels of silver, uh, silver for this. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron. Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he named in the audience, sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver. And the land of Ephron, which was in Mechola, which was in Mamre, the field, the cave, which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field and all that were at the borders round about were made sure. Unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of the city. <coughs> so he did it in front of many, many witnesses. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the field of Mechpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So here you have Abraham putting his stake in the ground at the very land God promised him, that land of Canaan, uh, or will one day be that which is now occupied by the Hittites. But I want to kind of point out something and a lesson I learned through this and, and, and doing something in front of witnesses. Uh, my grandfather, back in the day, you know, we have to have a lawyer for everything. If you ever buy a house, if you ever buy a parcel of land, man, even if you buy a car, you've got stacks of paperwork this big. And they want to try to catch you every single way you could try to slip out of that because people are just dishonest these days. So they have to keep inventing new pieces of paperwork that you have to sign. This is the lemon law. You have to ensure that I gave you this. This is the warranty. This is that you will pay it. This is that we will come after you. This is that, you know, you have a piece of paper for every little thing that you have to sign. Well, back in Portugal, in the days where my grandfather was coming up, before my dad came to the United States, he would have these vineyards that he tended to. And when he wanted to buy a parcel of land to put olive trees or put vineyards, uh, he would basically just uh, grab a witness and say, this is the deal. I am going to give this man this land for this amount of money. They would shake on it, and that would be that. And because there was no paperwork or files where you would keep these things, when someone wanted to verify the purchase of a land, they would have to then go get those witnesses and say, did did Mr. Manuel, did he, uh, did Mr. Nesimento, did he say to, to this man that he would give him this land for this? And that witness would have to verify, and that word you know, their word was their bond. That was how they struck deals back then because that, that meant something. And that's how Abraham did it this day in the audience of the sons of Seth, just in case the Hittites came back and said, no, he didn't. Abraham did not rightfully purchase that land. He has no lake. He has no claim laid to it, but it was, it was uh, verified in the mouth of many witnesses. It wasn't just more than one. The Bible says it was an audience or all them that were at the gate of the city. So it's just interesting to me of how we do things today and what our word means to, uh, to people today, which is virtually nothing. I can't tell you how many people that said, I will show up at this day for the job. I hired someone. I hired someone the other day. He's supposed to show up Monday. Uh, I called him. I text him. I had my manager call him. I had my manager text him. Voicemail box is full. Didn't answer the text. Did not show up on Monday. And he uh, sends us a message Tuesday night wondering when he can come in or if he can still come in. I'm sorry, but we're not going to hire him. You know why? Because his word means nothing. Because he, he had promised me he would show up at this date for the work. 
And if I give him a second chance, it's kind of like shame on me. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So uh, I've just learned that if someone can't keep their word, even in the beginning, very seldom are they ever going to keep their word through the duration of their work life with you. So it's, it's something to be said for maintaining a, a good name, uh, being able to be able to validate something and just witnesses that other witnesses can vouch for your, um, your authenticity and verify something. And unfortunately, we just don't have that today. Unfortunately, no matter how good my name or reputation is for doing what I say I'm going to do, I'll always have to sign a ton of different paperwork, and that's fine. You know, that's just how things are run today. But as a Christian, you shouldn't have to have all that stuff. You shouldn't have, people shouldn't have to, you know, I, I would I would hate it if if a reputation was said about me that I just couldn't keep my word. Your word is your bond, and whatever it is you say, I don't care how much it inconveniences you, how much you have to alter your life. If you're a business owner, you have to give stuff away for free. You know how many free pizzas I've given away because I've promised a certain quality of work and and product to be turned out. And if someone says, hey, you burned a pizza or I had to wait this much longer, you said it would be this and it's not that, and I'll have to give them free product. I don't care how much I have to eat that because what's more important to me than making a buck on that person buying pizza is that I maintain a good reputation. And the most important is that I'm known for doing exactly what I say I'm going to do. Uh, and that's a good lesson for all Christians. All right. Thank you guys so much. This was the shortest lesson we did at 26 minutes. So we look forward to the next lesson. See you guys.